This episode is brought to you by Anchor.fm. If you haven't heard of Anchor, you should definitely check them out. It's a super easy tool that anyone can use to create and distribute their podcast. It has everything you need, and you can do it all from your computer or even your phone. Need your podcast cover art? There's a tool. Music and sound effects? They have you covered. Want to record on the fly? It's easy with the app. Now you may be saying to yourself, I already have a podcast. No worries. Just create your account, upload, and publish to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Looking for some walking around money? Anchor connects you with advertisers who match your brand. It's a one-stop shop for all of your podcasting needs. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to BizQuick. I'm Julie. And I'm Corey. And on today's episode, we have Alex Vonderhaar out of Cincinnati, Ohio, who is the CEO and founder of Hidden Falls Media. That's right. You're listening to BizQuick. This is where Julie and Corey provide quick and useful information to small business owners. BizQuick is the podcast where small business owners get to showcase their businesses and receive expert advice and guidance in areas many entrepreneurs struggle with. And you, the listener, get solutions, tips, and tricks on real-world topics that many small business owners face. Julie and Corey are the experts small businesses hire when they need solutions. And the BizQuick podcast is just one way they deliver those solutions. Let's start the show. Hey. Nice to hey, meet you. Alex. How are you? Great. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, we're looking forward to the conversation. I think it's going to be really interesting today to, to learn about your company and, and what you do. Um, but let's just go ahead and start off with that. Tell us a little bit about your company. Cool. So we're what's called a neuromarketing company. So we look at neuroscience and psychology research and apply it to marketing campaigns. Since all these businesses out there are focused on digital, that's where our primary focus is at right now. But what's so phenomenal about the field of neuromarketing is that it doesn't matter what the technology or flavor of the decade is, starting from a place of understanding the psychology of your customers and what their buying patterns are and what their habits are really allow us to transcend any platform and move with the audience as opposed to trying to constantly play catch up along the way. So that's why we've really kind of taken that approach to marketing. It's not something a lot of other agencies have done. But when we look at big tech companies, a lot of them actually have neuromarketers inside their company or neuroscientists or psychologists. So they can look at the human behavior of how these different platforms and technologies interact with us on a day-to-day basis. You guys have been around for like three years, Hidden Falls Media. Um, what, what prompted the the idea for the business, because I I have to tell you, I'm not sure that I find myself wondering how many companies do this that I don't even realize, like how many marketing agencies take the same approach. So what, where did you come up with the idea? Yeah. So my background is actually in neuroscience and psychopharmacology. So I was looking at how different drugs affect the brain and behavior. So that's where I was educationally trained. And I did what I call the good boy route. So you go to school, you get the degrees, the pieces of paper that society says you need. And they're, the promise lands on the other side of that piece of paper, right? Not the case. Uh, I couldn't get a job making more than minimum wage coming out of college. And I had the pieces of paper and all my teachers and advisors. And they're saying, yeah, you should be making 60, 70,000 your first year or so. Within the first two to three years, you'll be out there making six figures plus. Not the case by any stretch of it. So I started training Brazilian jiu-jitsu with with a buddy of mine that I'd been friends with in high school. And he brought me to his gym that he trained at. And I started sparring and kind of rolling with another guy that was similar build to me. So I'm 6'5", and he's super long, long and lanky too. Found out he ran a flotation therapy center. So using float tanks and being in the psych and neuroscience background and listening to Joe Rogan and other podcasts, I'd always been like super intrigued by float tanks. So I started, I went a few times, I floated and him and I started talking. He was like, Hey, I really need somebody to help me kind of get this thing up and moving. So within 18 months, I got a job there and we took it from a hundred thousand in debt up to 2.2 million in sales using Instagram, Facebook, and Google. And along the way, we realized how much of psychology and neuroscience actually gets implemented into digital marketing campaigns that are successful. Because at the end of the day, marketing is all about connecting with humans and telling stories and getting them to actually involve themselves in the brand. So that's what we did. We focused on different ways to kind of bridge uh, different sensations, different experiences into the brand 
both online and in person. Um, after those 18 months, I was still making like $8 and change an hour and I was not full time. So I decided I was going to go out and start this on my own. I had no clients. I had no experience in running a business. It was entirely off of, I know I'm really good at this and I know I can do it again. So we started January 1 of 2018. So we're almost at the three year mark and it's been a wild ride. I mean, I've literally bootstrapped this thing from having $0 in the bank account to making it to where it is now. And it's been an incredible ride and I wouldn't change anything about it. That's amazing. I am curious if your buddy who has the float tank business, did he give you a percentage of the revenue that you helped? No. Wow. So you really just did it to kind of learn and see, and yeah. that's where you realized you were good at it. That's, that's spectacular. Do you, so from a client perspective, when you're working with people now, do you just, you basically take over their messaging and all of their marketing and you, and you're writing that content for them and all of the copy and, and putting together the strategy for marketing it or is that how it works? Times, a lot of times we are working on copy. So typically when a client comes to us, we're looking at 90 day sprints with them because there's a lot that can happen in 90 days, but it's also right. We don't want to over promise the moon and under deliver on any of it either. So looking at those 90 day sprints is a really good way to do that. And typically one of the biggest issues we see within people's marketing is the copy. So not understanding clearly how to write to the audience, not putting their needs first. They're putting the spotlight on the business instead of on the customer. So there's a lot of small things that we start out with, but typically copy is one of the first ones. But when we work with companies, we can't act as a full third party marketing department for them. There's a lot of times we actually just plug into the marketing team that they already have and we act as a consultant for them on how to do certain things or how to launch certain projects. So being a, a, a relatively new business, uh, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, how does a marketing company market itself? Yeah, that's a really great question. We're still learning that and it's a daily evolution. So come and <clears throat> being fully transparent as to where we're going for the rest of this year, moving into next year, we're putting all of our eggs inside of the content basket and we're just going deep and deep and deeper inside of content. So looking at taking the Gary V pillar content model of taking a long piece of video content and then doing mass distribution and editing based off of those. So doing podcasts like these, it's a phenomenal way to reach inside of different audiences that you normally wouldn't have access to. You're building credibility, you're building the no like and trust factor and then bring them back into your audience. And then having that ability to nurture them with your own content is really the strategy that we're going for. Paid ads are expected to get stupidly expensive. So the best thing that we've figured out to do strategically is just to put ourselves right in the heart of our customers, which we think is the best way to do that is through content. What's the, um, for small business owners who are just getting started and don't have a lot of brand recognition brand penetration yet so they haven't really established that no like trust mm -hmm. process yet which is so critical for success what are what are some tips that you can give people who are just starting out and can't afford to outsource to a digital agency like yourself yeah there's actually a massive advantage to having that position because you're because you're the underdog and everybody loves to root for the underdog so it's turning the camera onto yourself because most people have a smartphone that have Wi-Fi or internet capabilities and just starting to tell your story. I know that's really cliche, but so many people don't do it. And it's the basis of what's going on. When you can bring your customer or bring your audience into your experience of what's happening in your day-to-day -day life, you're giving them something to root for. You're giving them the ability to engage with you on a different level that they can't get with bigger brands. So it's a massive advantage when you're smaller like that because each one of those comments and each one of those engagements that you're able to cultivate has such a lifelong effect because it's only going to spread positive word of mouth when you're there for the right reasons. That's interesting. And I'm going to ask you a question which I recently asked uh, another guest that we had who was kind of talking about uh, bringing your personal life into your social media and marketing and all of that. How much is too much? As far as posting or as far well, no, as no, like, no, like, like how, building like, the personal brand into the business? Yeah. Yes. Like, like, like how, like how, where, where do you stop? Like, where would you suggest stopping? Like 
you know, me just showing you pictures of my oatmeal that I had for breakfast versus <laughs> like what the product or service that I sell. Totally. I think any piece of content that you can tie a story around to that serves your business is fair game. And as long as they align with the core values of who you are and what your business aligns up with, I think is also fair game. It's totally fine to have the boundaries as long as you're the one that set them and not the audience. Right. We all have that level of privacy that we want to be able to keep. And it's important to some more than it is to others. There's some people that they want to overshare and that they're going to do it, whether we put up the guidelines to tell them not to, there's a lot of just being a, being aware and having a little bit of sensory acuity around you to recognize, like, I probably shouldn't share the fact that my girlfriend and I just had a fight on my social media for my business, especially if she likes the page and engages with it. Right. So it's just having that sensory acuity and that awareness. You wouldn't go to a cocktail party and start spewing all the negative crap that comes around with your business sometimes, or that you just lost a customer or that uh, your car broke down on the way there. Right. You wouldn't go over all of that. You would want to keep it at a certain vibrational or energetic level and not to try to drop that conversation back down. But I think it all comes down to what you're talking about. We talk about content in the form of the six human needs that uh, Tony Robbins talks about and creating pillar content around each one of those things. So certainty, uncertainty, love, connection, belonging, significance, and starting to figure out content strategies around each one of those, because that's always going to guide us back to the customer more than it's going to be focused on us. So to your question of, do I post my oatmeal? Was well, your oatmeal going to make somebody feel significant? Or is it going to make them feel like they have a sense of belonging or connection with you or that they feel more certain because you posted the picture of your oatmeal? So going back to these key pieces, it's knowing what to kind of position yourself around. I feel like given the way society is working right now, it's just going to make people who have a grain intolerance feel bad about themselves. So maybe don't post that. <laughs> yeah. Also, I don't know if I want to work with anybody who's interested in my oatmeal. So. <laughs> Fair enough. So what what's something that um, advice or that you learned early on that really helped your business when you were first starting out and you had that $0 balance in your bank account. Every relationship matters. I'm, I'm always looking at every relationship, every interaction that I have with somebody as how can I serve and coming from that servant mentality has really, really accelerated our growth within the first three years. So, so talk about that servant mentality a little bit more, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. So every time I end a call with somebody, one of the very last questions I'll ask them is how can I serve you? Who can I connect you with that I may know or what type of openings or opportunities are you looking for? And by becoming the guy that people come to because they know I'm going to ask those questions and try to connect as many people as possible with that, it puts me right in the prime seat of wanting them to be around that relationship. And it also opened up a lot of doors for our customers too because now they feel like they can come to us with any question and there's not this weird judgmental aspect. It's that they expect it out of us and they expect that we're providing that next level customer service that they really can't get anywhere else. Yeah. And it, it's funny, the, the, just that customer service aspect. And it, it, it is really amazing at how many doors can get open just by being that person. I mean, I have, yeah. I have a background in, in customer service and, you know, restaurants for years. So um, it, it, it's funny how many people in businesses don't really understand that that's what they're really selling. Yeah. Selling the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Disney doesn't sell roller coasters and ice cream. They sell the experience of happiness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, and I, you know, we remind our, our clients all the time that, you know, that no like trust factor is so important, but people don't, people aren't really buying your product or service. They're buying you and they're yeah. buying, you know, so it's the relationship and, and how you do that. And I, one of like our favorite questions to ask people is how can we support you? Like, what do you yeah. need? And honestly, the origin of um, SB Pace was simply when the pandemic started and we have all these friends and family who run small businesses and we were calling and checking on them to say like, Hey, what do you need? How can we support you? How are you positioned to get through this? Like, what's your biggest struggle? 
And it literally turned into a business because we realized very quickly there were a lot of small business owners who were really, really struggling when this started and still are. 100%. We're, from my end, kind of what we're seeing on an agency side is we're seeing two really interesting trends. We're seeing a lot of brick and mortar or traditional businesses that have never had, they've never had a deep enough pain point to move online to fulfill their customers' engagement ratings or to feel like that they need to be able to buy or sell their products online. COVID happened, now they're moving in droves over to e-commerce. And then what we're seeing from people that started inside the e-commerce realm is that they're looking and waiting for the commercial real estate space to kind of take a dip and wait for all these traditional businesses that have been in there for a long time for all that square footage to open up and then take their e-com experience and extend that brand into a physical brick and mortar now. So we're kind of seeing these two opposite directions moving at the same time, which is really cool to see. Yeah. So speaking of COVID, um, what, what sort of recommendations, if any, do you give to clients with respect to still talking about it? I mean, we're six months into it and quite honestly, I feel like most people are just tired of talking about it. Sure. But there's a, very large percentage of the population who still want to know how businesses are dealing with it. So how do you, what's your approach with it? If you, if you have one, do you address it? Do you depend, pretend it's not there? Like what's the story? We use it like salt in a dish. You can use it to enhance the flavor, but it shouldn't be the main focal point. I like, I like that. That's really clever. good, Good analogy there. We wanted to take a quick break to tell you more about SB Pace, the small business consulting company that makes this podcast possible. SB Pace, which stands for Small Business Planning, Advising, Coaching, Expertise, focuses solely on helping small businesses and entrepreneurs. Are you looking to start a small business of your own? SB Pace can get you up and running with a solid foundation that's built to last. Are you an existing small business in a slump or just looking for ways to improve what you do? We can help with that. Are you ready to take your business to the next level? SB Pace is the partner you need. You can find out more about SB Pace and what we have to offer by visiting our website, sbpace.com. Going back to what you're talking about, like just kind of the the shift in businesses and um, how online companies are, you know, going one way and and all of that. Um, We like, we have a client who uh, the majority of his business came from networking, like face to face, shaking hands, you know, and he's having a hard time right now transitioning into that. What would your advice be to people who are, who are like that? I think there's a massive opportunity. I started out the same way with in-person networking being my primary source because I understood I wanted the local word of mouth to really carry for me before I started to expand those circles outward. And I think there's a massive opportunity still out there, especially within Facebook groups, LinkedIn communities, getting into like subreddits and different categories and starting to create relationships online. There, it's, the, it's the same song and dance. It's just now we've got space and we have something to kind of act as a, act as a barrier of separation. So for the people that are really able to thrive in networking situations, one of the things that we've talked about is you can still have that. So what does it mean to turn the phone to you, record a quick video and send it to the people that you would normally go to networking events for? Instead of just typing them out a message, turn it around, send them a video on IG or on Facebook that's specifically personalized to them. And you're still starting to get that same experience. So there's, it's just leveraging the technology to still get to that same end result that you want, which is to build and nurture those relationships. Now that we're just forced to kind of turn the phone on us a little bit more, there is that awkwardness, especially if you've never done it before. But if you already have those relationships, why is there that awkward feeling then? It's entirely on you and what you're perceiving. Yeah, we just recently started to, well, I'll say we, but it's really me because um, Corey's not on social media. So that's my, that's my gift to the business is I run all the social media. And I committed probably about, it's, it's fairly recent, you know, like end of September, like mid to end of September that every day I was going to do video posts on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much more engagement and you can see like the impact that the videos have in that, you know, I, I generally give like a call to action with story, which is, you know, right. but it's more 
it's not a call to action to do something for our business. It's for people to do something for their business, right? And um, I've gotten a lot of messages back from people that are like, hey, I, you know, I was always afraid to do video messages, but now because you're doing them, I started doing them and my yeah. engagement is higher. And so it's been, it's interesting to see, and it's, I don't enjoy doing it, but it's, it's one way to really let personality come out. In, which you can't do in a flat picture, right? right. You don't really see yeah. it. So that, that's the nice part of it. Totally. You mentioned something really awesome that not a lot of people do, which I wanted to commend you for, which is call to actions that don't involve a sale, right? So we, a lot of the shows that we do, we end with go make somebody smile today, right? So we're spreading the idea of happiness or a higher emotion that's not based off of a quick and dirty kind of transaction, so I were constantly investing inside of that emotional piggy bank for all of our audience and all of our clients too. So I, by the time we do try to land that ask for anything, uh, it goes over a lot better and it's not so kind of transactional at that point. Yeah. It helps to, it helps to work on that no like trust, right? Yeah. You're building the relationship and then it's like, Oh, Hey, I need that help. And then who was that guy that we talked to? And then they remember and they're, and they come back. So, and it's a very, uh, one of the things that I've been interested in for us is the length of our sales cycle, right? I think mm -hmm. when we first started, we thought it would be really, really short. The people are like, oh, you're selling something I need. And that has not proven to be the case at all. It's very, it can be very long for us because you have to build that relationship and totally. really work on that first before you can even really ask for the sale. People need to know that you know what you're doing and that you're likable. Right. Yeah, and I think one of the things especially that's been helpful during this whole pandemic is the way our business started by, you know, calling and asking if we could help anybody. And, you know, we're not selling a service. We're just like legitimately asking, like, what do you need help with? Right. And we've turned that around where when I say we, where Julie has been going out um, and asking, just asking for help, you know, and it's just amazing how many people will respond to that just to say, oh, what do you need? I don't even know if I can help, but let's talk. Yeah. And so Being that super connector. Yeah. And, and just realizing that, that just saying the word help, it doesn't make you weak, even though I won't say it, but. <laughs> <laughs> fact, fact. He, I try to get him to say it every day. He won't do it. <laughs> so what, um, how long do you, how long is your, are your typical engagements with your clients? I know you said you do like these 90 day sprints. So do you normally yeah. like sign on for 90 days with people or how does it work? Yeah, typically we sign on for 90 days, but there's a lot of times that we've been going longer. Our average, so we've been in business for three years. Our average customer life cycle is about 16 months. So pretty good that we've gotten over half so far keeping with us. The biggest thing for that that we found is communication. And when we've changed strategies, when we've had to pivot a little bit, keeping them in the loop and keeping our content with them and kind of up to date has really helped because they feel like they're on the journey with us. They want to root for the underdog to succeed, right? They, they want to see the small guy win out against Goliath, which are Madison Avenue <clears throat> companies out in LA. Even in Cincinnati, we have some big ad agencies, but they won't look at you unless you're ready to spend $500,000 a month or more on ad spend. So it's like, well, where does that fight for the little guy? And there's a massive amount of power in that, especially with building an audience from a grassroots like we have. Yeah. And how, what's your typical, when somebody reaches out to you and they're interested in your services, is it, what's your sales cycle look like? Is it, is it a pretty quick close for you guys or does it, do you work and nurture with them for a while before it happens? It depends. We're really rare in the fact that I don't take a lot of clients. So we take clients that we know we can help and there's some that we, more than some that we turn away pretty regularly. But when we turn them away, it's not just, hey, I can't help you. It's, hey, we're just, you're not in a spot where we're able to actually use your money wisely. So here's the steps that I would recommend that you take before you go out and look at an ad agency again. So that way you come prepared and that way you're not wasting money when this time is actually right to have this happen. What a high integrity move. Good for you. And it's, yeah. it's come back. So you're talking about the life cycle of a client, right? These are the reasons why clients stay with us for months and months, if not years, because- I don't want them to waste their money. It doesn't do me any good. It makes me look like I don't know how to do my job. Right. And that's, that's a, a really hard thing for small business owners, especially just starting off or, or, you know, who yeah. are struggling to turn away business. But 
you know, I, I would say that's probably paid for itself, you know, having that, that oh, mindset. What's, what are some reasons that you would, that somebody wouldn't be ready yet to work with a marketing agency? Yeah. So there's a few different ways that they come to us, whether they're looking for, so we'll take the paid ad approach, right? Um, it, it's no secret that you got to pay to play for business. And unfortunately right now, the dominating markets for that are social media platforms and Google and SEO. So looking at that from a paid media standpoint, let's say you're an e-com brand that sells apparel. Well, let's look at all your competition out there that's also selling online apparel. If you're gonna come to us with a hundred bucks or 500 bucks a month and say, look, this is all I got, but I wanna make it work to be able to 10X, 30X my money, it's, just, it's not gonna happen, right? You have to be competitive in that auction marketplace in order for that to happen. So we need to be realistic about what is actually going into the system and what we can expect to put out of it. So those are, that's a first initial reason. There's other times where they don't have distribution set up very well. So we work with a lot of e-commerce clients. I like e-commerce because it's very black and white. You either made the sale or you didn't make the sale or they added to cart, but they didn't check out. So what's your distribution look like? We've, we've made the mistake early on of getting a client too many results up front. And it broke their back end distribution system and it cost her over half a million dollars. So all the money that we made her ended up getting lost because of distribution and supply chain issues. So now that we know that these are, these are real variables that come into play that a lot of business owners haven't considered of what happens when you get the 10,000 online sales in a week, do you have the manpower or the inventory or the processing systems in order to make these successful, right? So there's a lot of different steps that go into this. Whether and if we're looking at branding, do you are are you even in a place to create content yet? Have you created content? Or are you afraid to create content? If you're afraid to create content, you know, paid media is only going to get you so far outside of having the organic to move along with it. So there's a lot of reasons why we won't take people. We'll make suggestions along the way of saying, hey, you should really have X, Y, and Z done. Then let's talk. Okay, that makes sense. Um, you spurred a thought in my um, head when you were just talking there, when you were talking about the, the, the client and the supply chain issues. How, so tangentially related, if you, uh, we have a friend who has a physical product that they sell and um, supply chain issues this year um, because yeah. of, you know, COVID and they're about to run on a product and can't get any more until the beginning of the year, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, how, what would your guidance be for how that small business owner can stay relevant with their marketing so that they're still top of people's mind and kind of building brand awareness, even though they don't have any product to sell right now? Totally. That's probably a really good thing because everybody is going to be inundating them with sales and asking for the hard right hook over the next few months. So we're coming into Black Friday season. It's anticipated to be the most expensive ad season that we've come across on social media platforms purely because there's all this pent up money that people didn't spend over the last few months because of this high level of uncertainty now that they're moving into holiday season, they're in this panic mode of I've got to make so many sales in the next few months to make up for all this lost cash flow. Well, that means I'm going to throw every the kitchen sink and the baby in the water at these ads and hope that something works. So ad prices are probably going to go way up. So what would I do in this time is exactly what we're doing internally with our company, which is doubling down on content looking at ways to engage through surprise and delight, which is the most common but most effective form of marketing when it comes to content production. So if you look at some of your favorite commercials out there, odds are it's surprise and delight. So let's look at like the Jake at State Farm commercial when it very first came out. Uh, remember the wife comes down the stairs, he's on the phone secretly and he's like, so what are you wearing? <laughs> right? so, there, so there's the surprise and the delight aspect to it. We look at some of the most successful Super Bowl campaigns. They start with a surprise and delight, but they're really good at ping ponging your attention from TV back to a social media account. So looking at different ways that you can layer in humor, that you can layer in surprise and delight and fulfill that Maslow's hierarchy of needs for them through their content, or going back to what we were talking about with Tony Robbins and the six 
human needs, creating content around each one of those to really build and develop those deeper relationships through content. It's going to outplay just wasting money on ad season. When let's face it, you're probably not going to be able to outspend Dick's or Macy's or JC Penney's or some of these other or Under Armour or Nike. You're just not going to be able to outspend them this holiday season on ads. So play a different game to get the attention. Don't waste the money on things that you're not going to be able to win in. That's great advice. It, it is. And this conversation has been amazing, but we're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, no so we, we could probably go on for, for another 30 minutes, but could you uh, just let everybody know how they could find more about your company? Totally. So you can find us on social media everywhere at Hidden Falls Media, or you can follow me directly at alex.vonderhaar, V-O-N-D-E-R-H-A-A-R. Perfect. And we'll, we're going to put all this, that information in the show notes for our listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to our listeners. This has been a great, like a fantastic episode. Yeah. And you can connect with us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find out all that information on our websites, sbpace.com or bizquickpodcast.com. Definitely subscribe to our podcast, like, and rate us. Um, those ratings help for us to show up and, and be present for more and more small business owners. And make sure you give us a review. We really like the reviews. And reach out to us if you have any requests for topics that you want us to cover, if you want to be on the guest on the show. Um, and finally, we've got a book out. It is called Seriously, Now What? A Small Business Guide to Disaster Preparedness. You can find that on Amazon. Uh, we have links to it on our site. So check that out. I'm Julie. And I'm Corey. And this was BizQuick, helping small businesses across America. 